Ryan Nemhart and Graham Ike are very different players than they were in Maui against Purdue. And if they play like they have lately, this Gonzaga team, they're going to be in the Elite Eight. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to provide news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's game day episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by Nissan. Folks, are you afraid? Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things just a little bit further? Have you ever wondered what adventure could be just around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. Well, folks, it is game day. We are going to talk Gonzaga Purdue. We're going to talk about the five things Gonzaga needs to do to secure it a victory and advance to the Elite Eight. It is also game day for the Zag women, 7 p.m. in Portland. They will take on the number one seeded Texas Longhorns. Uh, we're also going to talk today about Florida Atlantic. They have a new coach who has Gonzaga ties. We're also going to talk about the WCC losing another coach, gaining a coach at Pacific, also 30 Two players from the West Coast Conference already in the transfer portal, including Joshua Jefferson, starting power forward for St. Mary's. We're going to talk about all of that. But first, let's get ready for this Gonzaga-Purdue game. We've talked about it already a handful of times this week, of course, getting ready for a rematch against Purdue, the Boilermakers, who Gonzaga not only took on last year in the PK Invitational, they also took them on earlier this year in Maui. Uh, as the first game of that Maui Invitational, the Zags had a five-point lead, ended up losing that one by 10, outscored 43-28 in the second half. The rematch will be tonight, Thursday at 4.40 p.m. Pacific time. The game will be broadcast on TBS. Uh, you can also get it on Max. You can get it on the March Madness app. Tons of different ways to watch this game. The game will be played at Little Caesars Arena in Detroit uh, and excuse me, it'll be on Friday. I think I said Thursday. It'll be on Friday. I'm getting my days mixed up. Regardless, that's the game time. The Zags right now are five and a half point underdogs, uh, according to FanDuel. But there are absolutely multiple paths for a way for Gonzaga to advance in this game. They're one of the most red hot teams in college basketball right now. So too is Purdue after a 40 plus point victory over Utah State in the round of 32 to get here into the Sweet 16. Here are the five keys. Let's just get straight into them. Key number one. And this is kind of an obvious one. Graham UK needs to stay on the floor. Graham UK needs to avoid foul trouble, and he needs to be the version of Graham EK that we have seen in the latter half of the year offensively. And you're asking him to do that in a very difficult setting. You're asking him to do that against a seven foot four, 280, 90 pound center who is mobile enough to move his feet, who is good at avoiding getting fouls called on him. The Zags are going to need to use basically every foul that they have in the front court, but they cannot use them early. Graham E.K. cannot pick up two fouls before the first media timeout. That has happened before this season, and it usually is not a good sign for the Zags. He did pick up two early fouls against Kansas, but as you recall, Gonzaga was down one at halftime against Kansas. When E.K. was on the floor more in the second half, Gonzaga jumped out to a huge lead and never relinquished it. This is a really tough task. For Graham, for Gonzaga, we'll talk more about how they can potentially mitigate that. Obviously, some double teaming, some triple teaming might prevent at least Graham and Braden and Ben and Anton and whoever's guarding him on the block from picking up too many obvious fouls. Uh, it's, a, it's a nightmare situation for Gonzaga. If they are in foul trouble, they can't play as aggressively defensively. It allows Edie, Edie to score more easily. Uh, it also challenges their depth. It takes their best defenders off the floor. Also, Graham, uh, Graham. Zach Edie is like a 79, 80% free throw shooter. So you're basically just giving up points because he's very consistent from there. But offensively, I think the big thing here is it cannot be the same as the way that Gonzaga played in the first game. And what I mean by that is Graham E.K. took 10 field goal attempts in the first game uh, against Purdue. Six of them were from the three-point line. Four of them were from two. He made all four of those shots from two. He only made two of the six three-point attempts. 
Now, Graham hasn't played remotely like that in months. So this, the odds of him suddenly taking a whole bunch of threes in this game, that would be wildly out of character. It was kind of shocking to go back and read the box score. Even after watching that game, I remember Graham E.K. taking threes in that game. But just the, the, the type of player that he is now is so different from the player that did that early in the season. So I don't think we're going to see a return to that. But we need to see him. Can he score over Zach Eady? It's a really tough task. Zach Eady is better than Hunter Dickinson. He's better than Mitchell Saxon. But Graham did score over both those guys, and both those guys are big. I think you have to let him try. I think you have to let him try. Because if he's able to do it, Purdue might then start having to double team. Then maybe Graham can get the ball out. You can get it out to open shooters. You can get some drives towards the basket, maybe lean into Eady, get some contact. Again, he's very good at avoiding fouls, and the refs are very good at not calling fouls on him. But you have to try to do that. I think if you go away from what has worked from you offensively because you're afraid that Graham's not going to be able to score on Zach Eady, you kind of already lost. You have to try to do what has worked all year long. If five times in a row Graham E.K. gets the ball, they are in single coverage, and he fails to score over Zach Eady, sure, you start doing some different things. And that's what I want to talk about here. Key number two, that short pick and roll is a critical, crucial part of this game for Gonzaga. It is what won them the game against Kentucky. It is what helped them blow the doors off of Kansas in the second half. And it's going to be a huge part of what they can do successfully against Purdue in this contest. And what I mean by the short pick and roll is a pick and roll offense, except instead of running it at the three point line, you run it closer to the free throw line. What that does is if teams go under on the screen, which is how they have defended Gonzaga throughout the year, that instead of Nemhard then being faced with an open three-point shot at the top of the key, where for the first half of the year, he was borderline incapable of making them. He shot 15, 1-5% from three in the non-conference this season. But once they started doing the short pick and roll, if teams go under on that screen, Nemhard then has the ball 11, 12, maybe 15 feet away from the basket. That's a pretty automatic jump shot for him. And what has the reason that has worked is Teams don't typically do that because it clogs the lane in a way where it's hard coming off that screen. If the defender goes under, it's hard to make that pass uh, to to the, the, the to Graham Ike in this case or Anton Watson, whoever's on the block. But Nemhard is really adept at being able to make that pass. So if he is, if Edie comes out on him, prevents him from hitting that jump shot, he can make that little short pass. Now. Edie's longer and bigger than Hunter Dickinson, than Mitchell Saxon again, than the other bigs Gonzaga has played this year. And he might be able to adequately defend that short pick and roll, you know, going under on that screen, leaving Nemhart open for that jump shot. He might be able to get his hand up and impact that shot. Again, Ryan Nemhart is, is pretty small. He's not a big guard. So I think that could create, create some problems. You could attempt to then run it with Nolan Hickman, who's a little bit bigger than Ryan Nemhart and is certainly capable of running that offense. Uh, there's other options that, that I think you can explore here, but I think you have to try that short pick and roll offense. You have to try to get Edie in space. It is not an area that he is super strong. It is the, the, the biggest limiting factor for him not being, you know, the one of the top five players selected in the 2024 NBA draft because there is concern about how he's going to defend in space in the modern NBA where that's what you have to do. Gonzaga runs a modern NBA style offense. They can try to exploit that matchup, pull Edie away from the rim and create some mismatches where they can potentially attack him, get some open looks and score that way. Key number three, you're also going to have to knock down those outside shots. You're not going to want to take 32 of them like you did the last time these two teams played. I don't advocate for that. I don't think anybody's advocating for that. But you're going to have to make more than six of them. I think if you make less than six threes in this game, you're probably not going to get a W. Something like eight of 19, if you told me that that's Gonzaga's three-point percentage in this game, I think there's a decent chance they win it. Because you're not taking as many threes. You're not giving away as many possessions. You're knocking down them. You're knocking them down at a higher clip. I think that's the way that Gonzaga is going to have to go. If they are going under on that screen and Nemhart's open from three, you got to take it. Again, you can't be scared. You've got to take those shots. You got to get the opportunities. Nolan Hickman has been red, red hot lately from three. If he's got a second of space, he's got to be shooting them. Dusty Stromer, who's been lethal from the corner, he's got to be shooting them. Ben Gregg coming off a high pick and roll, pick and pop, got to be shooting them. I, I think that there might be some fear that this team is like, oh, we we shot so poorly last time. We took 33 point attempts, you know. But if you're open, you got to take those shots. I don't think Mark Few is going to be mad at guys for taking open threes. He's probably not going to want Graham E.K. to take six of them, and I don't think Graham E.K. wants to take six of them. But if guys who are good shooters have open looks, you got to shoot them and you got to knock them down because if you're not knocking them down in this game, you're going to be in trouble. Key number four kind of goes along with key number one. Forcibly double Zach Eady. Make somebody that is not Zach Eady beat you on this team. And they might. They honestly might. 
Fletcher Lawyer and Braden Smith are red hot this season. They're both shooting over 40% from three, uh, both closer to 45% from three. These guys dramatically improved their three-point percentage from last year. These dudes are lethal shooters. And they have figured out how to work with Zach Eady, where Eady can get the ball out of his hands, get it to an open shooter. They can swing the ball around until somebody's wide open and they knock down a three. They're good at that. You're going to see it happen in this game, and it's going to be deflating. But I would rather get beat that way than single covering Zach Eady, getting all the bigs in foul trouble. He gets 19 free throws, knocks down 17 of them, has 30 points, 17 rebounds, and the Zags just never felt remotely competitive because Zach Eady did whatever the heck he wanted. That's the worst way to lose this game. If you double him immediately, you put a ton of pressure on him, you triple team him, you make him score through it. If he scores through a triple team, he scores through a triple team. If he passes the ball out on a triple team and Gonzaga's a little slow to rotate and they get an open three and they knock it down, you kind of tip your hat. You can't let that happen every time. Obviously, that's going to be a problem. But I would rather make Purdue do that than just single coverage Zach Eady or maybe like a soft double just kind of come at him right when he gets the ball. Because if that's all you're doing, he's he's going to dominate. And you're going to have a hard time winning this game and coming back in it because your bigs are probably going to be on the bench in foul trouble. And then key number five, you got to win the 50-50 balls. you got to play with an unbelievable amount of tenacity in this game. It's a big Ben Gregg game, big Anton Watson game. you got to have your workhorses just dive in for everything, making every single rebound a jump ball as much as they can. Obviously, avoid those fouls 92 feet away from the rim. That Those are bad, but... Getting, getting the jump balls, getting the loose balls, diving out of bounds, uh, playing aggressive defensively, uh, trying to get steals, you know, playing the passing lanes. You have to be hyper aggressive. And again, sometimes that might fail, but I think you have to do that. If you play passively in this game, you're going to lose. I think Gonzaga is going to have a hard time winning the rebounding battle because of Zach Eady, but you have to win the 50-50 battle. You have to win. You have to take the ball away from them as much as possible. You have to force them to make mistakes because you're oh so, so aggressive that they're, un- they're, they're surprised by it and they make mistakes. You have to do that. Leave every single thing on the floor in this game. Every single thing. Because you don't win if you don't. Everything needs to be on the floor. And if everything's on the floor and you still lose, you still lose. I mean, that happens. But I think that this is, this is not a game to hold anything back. Because if you're exhausted going into the, the final, the Elite Eight game against either Creighton or Tennessee, and you're absolutely wiped out, at least you're still going into that game. That's a better situ- situation than not being all that tired on Saturday when you're flying home because you didn't win. Well, we're going to move on and talk about the transfer portal. Joshua Jefferson at St. Mary's. He's one of 32 WCC players already entering the transfer portal. What it means for the Gales, what it means for the WCC, all that coming up. But first, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, the Spring Cleaning Champions Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in the below the waist grooming. Clear out that winter bush with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code locked on for 20% off plus free shipping. Their fifth generation trimmer features two interchangeable next gen skin. Skin safe blade heads, a standard one for just taking a little off the top, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. Spring cleaning doesn't just apply to the nether regions either. Get the full grooming experience with Manscaped's signature Beard Hedger Pro Kit and Handyman Electric Face Shaver. Whether you're looking to craft your signature look or just clean up that neckline, these are always the right tools for the job. So get 20% off and free shipping with code locked on at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with code locked on at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is also brought to you by Better Together. Is your bracket busted, but you want to stay in the game? Introducing Better Together, the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where teamwork triumphs talent and you can play with your friends, not against them. You pick more or less on real-time player stats, strategize with your partner to boost your odds, and climb the leaderboard together. Better Together also gives inexperienced players an immersive way to learn about DFS. Teaming up with and following the lead of experienced friends and teammates in a team contest can take away the fear of diving in for the very first time. Locked on college, or excuse me, locked on Zags fans, you need to know that you're the best players by participating in the Fan Challenge series for a chance to win real money prizes. You can see the app for contest details. So download Better Together now from the App Store and sign up using promo code Locked On for a chance to win your share of over $1,000 in cash prizes. Play with me in a contest this weekend. Remember the code Locked On because winning a load is fun 
But folks, it is better together. All right, folks, moving on from getting all us ready for that Purdue game. We're as ready as we're going to be. Looking forward to watching that one with you all together. Join the Discord channel, by the way, if you have not done so yet. You can hang out with us while we're chatting through the game. But I do want to move on and talk about the transfer portal. I've made this joke a handful of times on the show. I'll make it one more time. If the coaching staffs have to focus on the transfer portal and the NCAA tournament games ahead of them, so too do I have to focus on both the transfer portal and the games ahead of them and the coaching carousel, which we'll talk about to close out the show. But the big news coming out of the West Coast Conference, Joshua Jefferson, starting power forward for St. Mary's last year, a player who really, really hurt Gonzaga in that game in Spokane that the Zags lost. He has entered the transfer portal. 10.2 10.2 points per game last year. He also averaged six and a half boards, two and a half assists, and a little over a steal per game. He played 26 games. All of them were starts. He missed the end of the season with an injury. He was out for the final two uh, games between Gonzaga and St. Mary's, the regular season finale, and of course the WCC championship game. He did not play for them in the NCAA tournament when they got upset by 12 seeded St. Mary's, or excuse me, 12 seeded Grand Canyon. But this is a really big loss for the Gales. The Gales are already losing Alex Dukas to graduation. They did learn that they're going to get Mitchell Saxon back for a fifth year. feels like he's been there for longer than five years, but uh, a return for Randy Bennett that's much needed. But Mason Forbes, their starting power forward in lieu of Joshua Jefferson, I believe he's out of eligibility, but it was kind of hard to tell. He's played, He's been in college for five years, but he redshirted a year last year for St. Mary's. He was also here during the COVID year, so I think he might actually have another year of eligibility. Whether he's going to take it or not is, is not something I'm privy to right now, but Jefferson is a tough loss. I, I had him pegged as the potential defensive player of the year in the West Coast Conference prior to him going down with his injury. He was very impactful on both ends of the floor, very good scorer, uh, a guy who grew so much from his freshman year to his sophomore year. This is a tough loss. I'd be a little frustrated if I was a St. Mary's fan, if I was Randy Bennett. Uh, It sounds like this was a big surprise. Nobody was expecting this. A guy who, again, to to go from a a bit player as a freshman to having this huge starting role as a sophomore, he clearly dramatically improved. And then then leave after that, it's tough. It's tough. It's a tough loss. It's a tough part part of the business. No idea where he's going to go. He's from Las Vegas. I would be surprised if it's UNLV, but... You know, maybe that he wants to go to a school in a similar conference that didn't make the tournament. I don't know. Maybe he'll go to USC or UNLV or excuse me, uh, UCLA. Uh, USC doesn't have a coach right now. We'll get to that later. So that might be a little tough, but a tough loss, tough loss for the Gales. uh, Again, with also losing Dukas, with also potentially losing Forbes, this team's going to have some rebuilding that they're going to have to do this offseason. They do have a great recruiting class coming in, which will help them out, but still a tough loss. And again, Jefferson's one of 32 players who has entered the transfer portal out of the WCC. I use Evan Miyakawa's phenomenal website, evanmia.com, tracks all the transfer portal information. Uh, Of those players in the portal, eight of them are coming from Pacific, who, of course, fired their coach, uh, Leonard Perry. We're going to talk about that in the final segment. Seven of them come from Pepperdine, also fired their coach, Lorenzo Romar. One of those players is, of course, Michael Ajayi, who has landed at Gonzaga. Houston Millette, another one of those players, he's already committed to Alabama. You also have seven guys leaving from Portland. Shante Leggins going to have to do a full rebuild again. Seven guys leaving, Tyler Robertson also graduating. So that is a tough, tough group of players to lose for the Pilots. Three of them each from LMU and San Francisco. One of the LMUs, of course, Dominic Harris, who we've talked about on the pod already. Two of them from San Diego, but two big ones, Wayne McKinney and Deuce Turner. One each from Santa Clara and St. Mary's, of course, Joshua Jefferson being that player from St. Mary's. Some of the bigger names, we already touched on a few of them. Millette is already at Alabama. Deuce Turner and Wayne McKinney were the two best players at San Diego last year. That is really tough for Steve Lavin, who seems very allergic to using the transfer portal to his benefit. Now loses two players to his detriment. Curious to see if he's going to try to replenish from there. Uh, Juanse Gorosito is a big loss for Portland, a sophomore guard who took a big leap this year, who's a bit inconsistent, but at times played very, very well. He's going to find himself uh, a nice gig somewhere this offseason. Dom is one of three LMU players. Michael Graham, a big man who had a big impact on Gonzaga's loss to LMU last season in Spokane. Justin Wright was also one of their better players. He's in the portal as well. Then Javon Porter from Pepperdine, younger brother of both Michael Porter Jr. and John Tay Porter, who are both in the NBA, both played at Mizzou. Uh, Could be a possibility for Javon Porter to join them and go back home to Columbia. And of the Pacific players, Mo Odom was their best player last year. He is among those players in the portal. 
A couple other names to keep an eye on. Marcus Adams Jr. You remember him? The glorious one month that Marcus Adams Jr. was with the Gonzaga Bulldogs. He started his career at Kansas, entered the transfer portal despite being a, a freshman who had just enrolled because he'd enrolled in classes, came to Gonzaga, entered the transfer portal again, went to BYU, played very sparingly. Guess what? He is back in the NCAA transfer portal. When he commits, it'll be his fourth school in about an eight to nine month span, depending on when he actually commits. Tough. You know, he's, he's had a tough background. I don't want to judge him too much. I don't know what happened at Gonzaga. It's possible there was some academic reasons he couldn't even get into the school. I don't know. But you know, this is kind of the, the era we're in. We're going to see a couple of guys do things like this. Uh, also, Miles Rice entered the transfer portal out of the WCC, or out, excuse me, out of Washington State. So this is technically another WCC departure. Miles Rice was the player who beat L Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, missed a full year of basketball while recovering from that, comes to Washington State this year, averages 15 points per game, leads them to a seven seed in the NCAA tournament. If you're a, uh, if Wazoo is one of your other teams and you're like, how could a player like that do that? I caution you to think about the fact that his coach left. And I think a lot of times, and I'm not going to go fully on a soapbox right now, but people want to criticize the players for leaving. But remember, there's the coaches do it too. Like eight players leaving Pacific. Sure, they were recruited by Leonard Perry. And he's not there anymore. Seven guys leaving Pepperdine because Lorenzo Romar was the guy who brought them there. They don't want to play for a new coach. They don't want to play where they're sitting right now, not knowing who they're going to play for. I don't blame guys for hitting the portal in particular when they're in that situation. And that's what Miles Rice finds himself at Wazoo, uh, wanting to play somewhere else because his coach, Kyle Smith, is now at Stanford. And we're going to talk about that because Kyle Smith had an opportunity to return to the WCC, the longtime San Francisco head coach. He chose not to do that. He goes to Stanford. A former Zag is now the head coach at Florida Atlanta replacing Dusty May. Pacific also has a new head coach. We're going to talk about all of that. After a word from today's sponsor, Nissan. Folks, this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that has pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level that is my other alma mater. I went to Gonzaga for undergrad. I went to Seattle U for grad school, and the Red Hawks can only be described as a Nissan Armada. This red hot team, hardcore as it gets out there after winning the CBI as a three seed. Could this success help land them as a team in the West Coast Conference? Could it push Coach Chris Victor to take the Washington State job or another job out there? We'll talk about that momentarily, but for now, folks, Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. All right, folks, closing out the show and the week today, although we will be back after Gonzaga's games on Friday evening. But we're talking more about the, the WCC and also just about the coaching carousel in general. Lots of coaching movement early in the offseason so far. Obviously, the big ones, Dusty May going to Michigan. We just found out Pat Kelsey, the Charleston head coach, is going to Louisville. That's a big one. A handful of other big coaching stuff has already kind of happened. But I want to talk about some of the, the ones related to Gonzaga and the WCC. And we'll start with the Pacific Tigers because we mentioned that they, they fired uh, Leonard Perry after what was a disastrous season for Pacific. They were one of the worst teams in all of Division I college basketball, according to Ken Palm, one of the biggest fallers from their preseason ranking to where they ended up. Kind of have to move on from a coach at that point. But Pacific's a very hard place to coach. It is in the, the greater uh, San Francisco Bay Area area, but it is not in a particularly good spot. Uh, it's close to Sacramento and Davis, and I think those schools can out-recruit them because people don't really like Stockton very much. They're in a conference where they're – not super realistically going to compete for an NCAA tournament. This is a tough place to coach. And so Pacific kind of felt like they had to go outside the box. And that's what they did. They hired Dave Smart. Now, Dave Smart was an assistant coach at Texas Tech last year. So that may not look like a super outside the box hire. Oh, you, cut, you hired a, an assistant coach at a prominent power six program. And certainly that is an element of it. Grant McCaslin, the head coach at Texas Tech, is from the Scott Drew coaching tree. McCaslin was a longtime assistant under Scott Drew at Baylor. So getting a coach who's kind of in the per periphery of being part of that tree is certainly not a bad way to go. But Smart is primarily known for being an incredibly successful college basketball coach in Canada. He won 656 games as the head coach at Carleton University in over 18 seasons. In those 18 seasons, 10 years, he was named the coach of the year. 10 times. The most proficient, successful college basketball coach in Canada basketball history. That is, it's a, it's a nearly indisputable fact that Dave Smart falls in that category. 
that's a great hire. You have to take that shot. Will it work? Maybe not. It might not work at all. But you, I think you have to try this. You get a bit of a, you get a pipeline to Canada. Is it going to impact Gonzaga's pipeline to Canada? No. Anybody that Gonzaga is interested out of Canada is not going to consider Pacific over Gonzaga. It's not going to happen. But it is an opportunity for them to, to open up that pipeline, land some kids from Canada who maybe wouldn't otherwise get a lot of Division One attention, who he's familiar with, who these kids want to play for a coach who's had this level of success. Uh, it's absolutely worth trying. Again, also somebody who was deemed worthy to be an assistant coach at Texas Tech, a power program in the Big 12. Like, I like everything, every single aspect of this coaching hire for Pacific, and I hope it works for them. I don't see Pacific turning into a big old powerhouse or anything like that, but I would love to see this program out of the cellar, raise the level of the WCC if we have it so that we don't have two or three teams hanging out in the bottom 75 of Ken Palm. That's going to help elevate Gonzaga's resume, St. Mary's resume. It's just going to help in a lot of ways. So it's a good thing for Gonzaga, and it's a great thing for Pacific. The other news, John Jacuz is the new head coach at Florida Atlantic University. He is a former Gonzaga director of basketball operations. Uh, he first joined Baylor's staff in 2012 under Scott Drew. He then came to Gonzaga in 2014 and was with the Zags for three years as the director of basketball ops. He went back to Baylor in 2017, and he's been there ever since. He was there when they won the national championship over Gonzaga in 2021. He was there kind of with Rem Bacchimus for a long time. Now Rem, of course, the director of player personnel under Tommy Lloyd at Arizona. But Jacuz is a guy who's been around the Gonzaga program and the Baylor program for a really long time. Uh, he's now part of the Scott, Scott True coaching tree that I mentioned earlier. I mentioned Grant McCaslin at Texas Tech, Jerome Tang who took Kansas State to the Elite Eight in his first season. He's a part of that coaching tree. Paul Mills, who took Oral Roberts to the Sweet 16 as a 15 seed. He's now the head coach at Wichita State, also part of the Scott Drew coaching tree. I can understand looking at a group of coaches that includes Jerome Tang, Grant McCasland, and Paul Mills and thinking, I would like to hire the associate head coach from Baylor because that seems to keep working for teams. That is why Jacuz got hired. And the question I want to have now, and we can perhaps have a longer conversation about this in the offseason, is, is Florida Atlantic the next Gonzaga. And I don't, I use that phrase jokingly because it's used, it's been used all the time and nobody's ever actually become the next Gonzaga. But there are some similarities here. They're just off by a year. Dusty May led Florida Atlantic to a miracle run in the NCAA tournament and then left to take a head coaching job at a Big Ten school. There was a year in between where he led them back to the NCAA tournament and they lost in the first round. That is the only major difference between Dan Munson leading Gonzaga to a miracle run to the Elite Eight, not the Final Four, but the Elite Eight, and then taking a head coaching job in the Big Ten at Minnesota. At that time, an unknown assistant coach who had been in college basketball for a long time took over as the head coach the following year. That was, of course, Mark Few. Jacuse was not already at Florida Atlantic, but he has coached with Mark Few. He has coached with Scott Drew. He has coached professionally in Europe. And now he gets an opportunity to take over this program that has a lot of juice, that has a lot of energy, that has a lot of fan interest, that's located in an area that's not considered remotely close to a basketball powerhouse in Boca Raton, Florida. A lot of similarities to when Mark Few took over. Now, Jacuz, all he has to do is go to the tournament for the next 25 years and not go take another job. Easy peasy. <laughs> Certainly easier said than done for, for Jacuz in Florida Atlantic, but it's something to note that there are some similarities and there's already a Gonzaga connection. Very curious to see how he can do taking over this program uh, from with a lot of pressure on him after the success that Dusty Mays had, uh, particularly the last two years, but also the last six years in general. I mentioned Kyle Smith already. He goes to Stanford. He is not coaching at Washington State anymore. He said, I don't want to be back in the WCC. I don't want to coach against San Francisco where he coached for a long time. Uh, he, This is a great job for him. I'm a little surprised he didn't hold out to potentially try to get the Louisville job, which has been filled by Pat Kelsey, the USC job, which is now open as Andy Enfield goes to Southern Methodist University. I am also very curious what Washington State is going to do. They have to fill a job that people are applying for that job, knowing that we're going to be in the WCC for two years. We don't know where we're going to be after that. WSU has an open athletic director right now because Pat Shun left for Washington. Like there's a lot of angst in Pullman right now, and it's going to be tough for them to find a head coach, but I'll toss out Chris Victor, the head coach at Seattle U, who was an assistant coach at Eastern Washington. So he's familiar with the area. He has led Seattle U to three straight 20-win seasons. Guess how many times that's happened in Seattle U's history? Once, and it was in the 50s when they had NBA Hall of Famer Elgin Baylor 
on the roster. So lots of success for Victor at Seattle U. David Riley, the current head coach at Eastern Washington, is being already considered as a candidate for this job. I totally understand why. Uh, we have seen coaches go from Eastern Washington to Seattle U in Jim Hayford and into the WCC, Shantae Leggins at Portland. Uh, so I could see David Riley getting that opportunity to go into the WCC and be the head coach at Washington State. Going to be curious how that coaching uh, search works out for the Cougars. I mentioned Danny Springle already briefly going to Washington. The main thing I'm curious about with that is whether he will be able to convince Zoom Diallo, the top prospect, or a top prospect, I should say, in the 2024 class, uh, who Gonzaga was heavily involved in recruiting, who committed to UW when Mike Hopkins was the head coach. Will he stay? Will Danny Sprinkle be able to convince Zoom to stay with the program, or will Zoom reopen his recruitment, what that could potentially mean for Gonzaga? Definitely keep an eye on that. Sprinkle, head coach last year at Utah State, took over a program where they had lost their head coach to VCU. Utah State expected to finish last or close to last, I think ninth in the Mountain West. They finished first. No surprise that Danny Sprinkle's already getting another job. He was fantastic for that team last year. It's going to wrap it up for us today here on the Locked On Zags podcast. We will be back after the Gonzaga games on Friday, so definitely hang out with us then. Looking forward to a couple of fantastic games, potentially a couple of Gonzaga victories over number one seeds. Uh, thanks for checking out the show. Don't forget to join us on our Discord channel if you have not done so yet. And until tonight or tomorrow, go Zags.